All right, welcome back to another episode of Two Point Sports. Um, today we're going to be previewing the last game of the season, probably the game that's got the most on the line for Oklahoma, for sure, and, and Baylor, the Bedlam game. It's always a good good game to watch, but this game seems to have a lot more riding on the line for OU than it typically does. Um, but before we get into it, we want to let you guys know that we really appreciate all of the support we've recently gotten. We just crossed 700 subscribers, big milestone for us. Let's try to get to a thousand by, you know, hopefully by the middle point of the basketball season, we'll be having basketball videos coming up here soon. Um, they just finished their invitation. They had a pretty good tournament. run in that tournament. Yeah. They only lost against in Utah. The finals. Against Utah State, which was, um, you know, they're a pretty good school. I don't know much about them, but Oklahoma has been looking good basketball wise. So, Make sure that you're subscribing, turn on the notification bell so that you know when we do release a new video, um, but let's get into it. So Bedlam, it is a huge game for Oklahoma. I think it's fair to say at this point, Oklahoma has been struggling a lot defense or offensively. Defense has for somehow not been the problem in Norman, but this Cowboys team looks very good on both ends of the field. Well, at least on the defensive uh, end, but they look pretty say. efficient. They look pretty efficient on the offensive side. The biggest thing that um, that I noticed whenever I was searching up their stats is that they rank 25th in time of possession, which seems to be the Achilles heel. So if they can stay on the field, it might be a long night for, for Sooner fans. But before I keep going any further, what do you think on it? Okay, personally, I think Oklahoma State's offense is horrible. Um, I mean, that's just simply put, I think they're awful. Um, I think Spencer Sanders is a horrible quarterback, um, despite uh, – I mean, at, at the end, the guy's not very good. I mean, that's it, just that's, – that's, that's the best way to put it. I, I don't think he's very good. Um, and outside of Spencer Sanders, like, they, there's not, like, one receiver that you see that's really, really elite. They, they don't have, uh, you know, a Chuba Hubbard-type running back. Uh, they don't have a James – they don't have a – uh, James Washington, they don't have a Des Bryant anymore. Um, you know, there's really nobody on that offense that stands out to me. Uh, and I obviously think Spencer Sanders is horrible. Um, so I think offensively, they're very bad. The problem is, for whatever reason, on defense over there, they're playing really, 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 really good football. Um, could be a low scoring game. Um, I don't know, man. Hopefully, if, I, I, if OU's offense gets it going like that, like, you know, they were when Caleb Williams first made the transition as to, to, to the starter. Um, if you can, if we can put up, if we put up anything above 24, I'll feel really good about it. Yep. Yeah, I think. So in regards to what you were saying with like guys that don't stand out, their wide receivers really aren't anything special statistically. The only threat that um, that could be is Tay Martin. He just because he's enormous, six three. Is there is there anybody but, on that offense who really has numbers that are sticking out this year? Or no, like uh, Jalen Warren's doing all right. He's got a thousand, one thousand seventy eight yards of ten touchdowns. Um, oh, they don't well, pass much out of the backfield. Yeah. But the the biggest thing there is, you know, J, as much as you may not like Spencer Sanders, he is having an okay year, and he is the type of quarterback that OU's defense does struggle against being a pretty good dual threat. He quit in the Bedlam game last year. I'm not saying that that was no, last dude, year. The man, I, I, I agree. Hold on. I agree it was, was last, last year, year, but the man straight up quit. He was afraid no. to go back on the field. He quit. He right. didn't want to play anywhere. But the, we're in These a new year. This, this defense, last year towards the end of the year, the defense was, was getting really good. Oklahoma's defense was getting really good. We were pretty good at third down. And this year, that's been a big struggle for OU until last game. We did have a find a way to hold the Cyclones to four of 18 on fourth down, but we did struggle when they did go for it on fourth down, only um, only stopping two fourth down uh, attempts. So they went five of seven. The biggest thing there is, like I've mentioned, Tay Martin is a really big wide receiver, and that's something that OU's defense seems to struggle against pretty regularly. I mean, Charlie Kolar had a big game. And He's still late, open, I think. Yeah, probably. And it's really just because the last drive, he had big numbers. But, I mean, he still had decent numbers before that, those last couple of drives. And if we can't – I would venture to say that if, if and when they allow Spencer to throw the ball, they're probably going to try to get somewhere in the middle of the field with Tate Martin since he's such a big human being. 
But I mean, he is in the, on the outside. I would probably expect Key Lawrence and not DJ Graham to be covering him, switching Key off. Key Lawrence him. did it again on Saturday with just – he's keeping that that string of just playing really good football uh, going. Um, that guy's good. But, uh, I mean, yeah, sorry I got distracted just because – you brought up Key Lawrence yeah, and that. I lost yeah. my mind. That guy has been playing so well, it's stupid. Yeah, the defense is, has looked a lot better once the the guys came back from injury and it was they the big, inserted it's... Key as the corner rather than uh, Billy Bowman, even though Billy, you know, I think I think he, he'll be amazing at OU. You think he'll be really good at OU at, when it's all said and done in his career. But Key has stepped up in a big, big way for the defense with stepping in at corner which was a spot where we were really struggling. What uh, about what about Woody Washington? He's back too, isn't he? Yep. So Woody's yeah, back. See, Our DBs I mean, are fully healthy for the most part. Um, and the defense really looks tremendously – I mean, we talked about it on previous mm-hmm. podcasts, but, like, we're, we're a different team and everyone's out there. Jalen Redmond getting the, the, the big man picks uh, – fumble six was cool the other the day. The thick six. The thick six, yeah, man. I think <sighs> this game, we know it's going to be low scoring, right? We can just probably assume that. Yeah, if it's high scoring, I'd be very surprised. It they both teams probably stick in the twenties, and that'll be a good day. It's, if you and it's unrelated, but if you think about it, with the Oregon loss Saturday, our season is kind of just right back where we need. At this point, all we essentially need is a, a Cincinnati upset somewhere. I don't think we need. Assuming it. we win the rest of our games. Right, and and we can get back on this. We can circle back at the end of the video because I do want to hear what you think um, about the OU season moving forward after this game. But the the biggest challenge will be can Lincoln finally get off whatever stubbornness he has been going on since the Texas Tech game and run the ball. You, we saw last game towards the end of the game they finally started get, giving Kennedy the ball and the offense looked better. The time where um, they were getting a burrito curse. You know, it's still coming up. He missed the field goal, and the only reason we were in that position is because we ran the ball to the red zone and then tried to pass it, and it didn't work. And we cannot have that happen against Oklahoma State because, like so you like, said, that passing defense is good. Yeah. So, like against Texas Tech, obviously Caleb Williams lit it up, right? Six touchdown passes, uh, you know, five hundred yards or whatever. It's, I mean, something stupid. He put a video game number against Texas Tech. And you're right. Ever, like ever seems like ever since that game, Lincoln has fallen in love with let's just pass the ball every single play. Um, and at the end of the day, I think Gus Johnson said it at the. Uh, I don't know if you you. I'm sure you watched the game against Iowa State. He said, "If you're at Oklahoma, you run the ball like point blank period." And uh, he's not wrong because like Kennedy Brooks this season, I think he has like almost 900 yards, but his yard per carry average is is ridiculous. It's like six or seven yards a carry. And I think just as a whole offensively, not even Kennedy Brooks, uh, look at Caleb Williams busting the 74-yard touchdown run on the first series that we had offensively. That guy can run too. If we just run the ball, period, uh, and I agree mostly Kennedy Brooks, but, you know, these read option plays, I'd like to see a little more options um, in which, you know, we can – if we can establish a run game, especially against a really good defense in Oklahoma State, it only makes everything easier. If if we – if we decide to drop back and pass the ball 50 times against Oklahoma State, I think we could be in for a long game. Yeah, and I think the key should be for Lincoln is use your stable of running backs. I know we're pretty depleted after what happened in the offseason, but you still have Kennedy. You just got Marcus Major back, and Eric Gray is still a good change of pace back. Let's use all three of them because I'm sure Kennedy, you know, maybe Kennedy is looking at the future. Maybe they've had that conversation because this is Kennedy's last year with Oklahoma, and he's – more than likely going into the NFL, going to be drafted. But so if that is something that, you know, Lincoln is concerned about getting Kennedy hit too much, then let Marcus Major play. He has fresh legs, only being only, you know, since he was suspended for the first half of the season, he's only played one game, kind of. It was at the end of the Texas Tech game where he really got some snaps. And and he looked all right, and I'm sure it would be valuable if we can get him just pounding the ball, giving – our running backs the opportunity yeah i think that was a big thing i noticed in the last game kennedy had 17 carries they came over 100 100, though yeah so he did that so that that's good and i wish he got more i think lincoln after that big the big first run for caleb his running attack was mainly focused on caleb running the ball and not kennedy and when he switched that 
ESPN, the offense looked better. I think Lincoln needs to dial up a little bit more. Uh, first of all, we agree that establishing the run game in this one is going to be very important, and it's something that we need to get after early. Uh, I'd, I'd, I'd like to see on the first possession of the game, you know, first down, it needs to be a handoff to Kennedy Brooks. Uh, it'll probably get you four or five. Then on second down, run it again. Instead of a third and short, third and one, third and two, and let's just kind of play, you know, kind of like a game control, control the clock type game. Uh, score three touchdowns because I truly think if we can control time possession and score three touchdowns and uh, you know sneak a field goal in there somewhere like I said 24 to me is that magic number uh, if we can score that 24 I will feel really really good just because I'm not a believer at all in Oklahoma State's offense um, but what I was also going to say that I think Lincoln should potentially think about busting out for a game like this against a really good defense in Oklahoma State is maybe go to your bag of tricks a little bit remember in that Texas game how many times we ran that direct snap to Kennedy Brooks with Caleb Williams in the backfield. And we mentioned back then, eventually sometime this season, we'll run that play a couple times, get the defense, you know, thinking about it. And then, you know, the fourth or fifth time we call Kennedy Brooks direct snap, he's going to toss back to Caleb Williams and someone's going to be just wide open. I mean, I promise you, if we run that play five times and the first four are all Kennedy Brooks fake to Caleb and then starts running up the middle, gets four, five, four, five, four, five, four, five. That fifth time you call it, if Kennedy Brooks takes a stutter step forward and acts as if he's going to a hole, they're all going to collapse on that. And then if you piss it off to Caleb Williams, I promise you someone's going to be 60 yards down the field. Like, hey, daddy, touchdown. Throw me the ball, please. Yeah, no, I think you're right. He, this is – if this, there's any game that Lincoln just needs to pull out all the stops, it's this one. I don't think he can look at – look too far into the future and – think that we might have a chance at the playoffs and he needs to save things for it. Like no, this so the, doesn't matter. The, the problem is, and it's a sticky situation because I, I would agree you pull all the stops. Um, and I want to see some crazy trick plays happen because I think it will work. Um, especially if they're well, you know, if they're, if they're designed well, um, I think they will work. But if we can get out and establish a run game and, you know, have a 10 point lead in the third quarter or something, and just keep running the ball well, you're hitting some slant plays, you know, screen passes, stuff like that. Um, then I think you could almost save some of these trick plays for – because at the end of the day, if we win, we're going to see this team again, like the very next week. It's it's weird. Uh, but, I mean, you're, you're right. It's, you're right in thinking – I mean, you can't you can't wait to pull out trick plays thinking you'll see them. I mean, at the end, you have to win Saturday and then worry about the Big 12 game after. Yeah. Yeah, at this point, this they can't focus even to the Big 12 championship because that's not guaranteed. We need to win. And I don't think that that anyone is expecting you know, Oklahoma to look past this game. But uh, I don't know. Just with how the offense has looked recently, I wouldn't put it – I wouldn't completely say that it's impossible. But – and the offensive line is also going to have a really big task ahead of them because that that defensive line for Oklahoma State has totaled 41 sacks on the year. Yeah, and, and, that's, that's, and a, that's especially with the uh, the Andrew Rain going down that I was thinking. I don't know his status for Saturday, but that injury didn't look great. No, and it's going to be tough. I, I think at this point, what I'm scared to see is that we're Lincoln tries to force the like the run with Caleb Williams because of that injury to try to get him out of the pocket, maybe try to get the defense guessing. But this is, I mean, you've, you've been saying it over and over. We need to establish the run, whatever running back they want to use. It doesn't matter. Establish the run, which would probably be Kennedy Brooks. And let, let's get the ball moving because once you can get those corners to start playing true and keep uh, and give Caleb one-on-ones, I believe that our receivers are better than the corners. We just have to give them the opportunity because we spread the ball around way more than Spencer Sanders does in the passing game. I think Tay yeah. Martin's got like 56 receptions and his, the other side, Brennan Presley only has 30 opposed to Oklahoma. And, and Everyone's going around 30. The whole receiver thing. Um, we should be even deeper this weekend with um, Drake soups. First of all, didn't play Saturday against Iowa say, I don't know exactly what he's dealing with, but I imagine he'd be back for this one. And Theo East is also suited up Saturday. He didn't play. But he warmed up, suited up everything, which means he has to be close. Like, there's a potential that we have Theo East back for this game, which is only going to help the offense with, you know, that's another five-star coming back, playing off. I mean, yeah, and it's definitely going to help because Stockner just hasn't looked good this year, and we need a big body. That's a red zone target. I mean, Mike Woods has been, you know, he came back last week, and he looked pretty good. But 
the bigger the receivers, the better at this point because the t- our tight end just isn't just hasn't been showing up. And you know, I I know someone in I saw someone in the comment section say maybe oh you dropped it with not recruiting Kolar and taking Stogner and, and being okay with it. And I don't think that's too much the case because obviously Stogner was a better was expected to be the and at the end, and high at the time when we were recruiting Kolar or you know when Kolar was entering college what, what year is Kolar is he a junior yeah or senior? This is a, a, I believe this is his third year he's which the same year as Stockner which means we had Grant Calvaterra on roster at the time and you can't foresee Grant Calvaterra having that injury um slash you know deciding to leave after the injury because facts are facts and Grant Calvaterra was a better tight end than, than Charlie Kolar um when he was at Oklahoma that, that that's that, that is what it is uh, and Lincoln can't foresee what happened with Grant Calcaterra leaving. So I, I don't – the whole thing, like, how do we let Kolar go? He's in our own backyard. Grant Calcaterra is better. That's how we let him go. I also think that it's probably fair to to guess that Kolar maybe probably didn't want to stay in Norman. He grew up there. Why? Well, they said on the – according to Gus and Joel's call Saturday, I think they mentioned that Kolar's from Oklahoma, Norman, Oklahoma. His parents mm-hmm. were both at OU and – it was his dream school. He always wanted to play there. So I think he may have, but uh, at the end of the day, if you're Lincoln Riley, Grant Calcaterra is better than Charlie Kohler. Yeah. It, that, that is a matter of fact. You're right. You can't. Hindsight's 2020, you know, and what's I mean, yeah, to the past what, in the past. What was with Grant Calcaterra, then obviously you go to Charlie Kohler, but you can't, you can't, there's no way you can see that. Yeah. Um, but let's shift over to our defense. I know we talked about their offense a little bit, and I think we've made it pretty clear. We think that we need to establish a run with our offense, but our defense this week needs to do what they've been doing over the last two weeks, especially the defensive line. If IT can have a repeat performance of what he did last weekend, it will be big time because if we can Our defense dress, needs to make them throw the football. Yeah. Well, yes. If, but again, that, that's kind of where Spencer Sanders being able to run the ball might be an issue, but if we can stress that guy out, like you said, last last year he was overwhelmed by no, he by quit. Oklahoma's defense. I didn't say overwhelmed. He, he quit. quit. He quit against he quit. Oklahoma. And quit. but That's a fact. if we can get this guy to stress out against our defense, and if we can get him to stress out, <laughs> then we have a chance to to then we can just focus on on Jalen Warren and I'll kind of play like we did against Iowa State because. Going into Iowa State, if you guys watched our preview, we mentioned we might be too heavy on the run stop where the pass might be there. You know, we were, you know, Kolar was always open and what have you, but we well, yeah, were able to stop Brees Hall. We need to keep, I would say, then we, we need to keep that same game plan. If we can stop Brees Hall, who I think is a far better running back than the guy at Oklahoma State, I'm not even saying their name. I think they're garbage. I hate them, but. If we can if we can contain their running game, Brock Purdy, I promise, is a hell of a lot better passer than Spencer Sanders. So if we can contain their run game and force Spencer Sanders to beat us, I think we'll be in a great position. Yeah, the defense is definitely going to see a lot of option plays. Just uh, it's clearly been what we've been struggling with all year. And if they feel like Spencer can run off a couple, you know, seven, ten yard runs from option plays, or they're going to be doing it and probably repeatedly until we prove we can stop it. And I think this defense is now in a position to stop it. They looked a lot better. Now the defensive line is fully healthy. The, you know, the back end is finally healthy. Um, This defense just has to put it together again. And I know personally, I think they're still, I'm not relying on the defense to show up weekend, weekend and week out, but if they do, I'm a happy, happy sooner. Because this is this defense has been too unpredictable over the the last couple of years, really. Even with Grinch, they're they're on and off too much to say they're one hundred percent showing up against this or this game. But they have had two good, very good lot, lost two games. They just need to put it together two more times at least you know to end the season. Outside of Key Lawrence, you know who's been really, 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 really good these past two games. Uh, I'm I'm not gonna guess. I think I know, but. Who? Guess if you think you just you go, you probably you're probably right. Uh, I was gonna say in the back end, and I was just gonna say DTY. No, I mean he has been a bit. Isaiah Thomas. Oh yeah. Have you seen what he's been doing since Jalen Red is back and he's playing in his real position? 
Yep. Yeah, he had two sacks against Saturday. He had two against Tech, total pass deflections. Uh, you know, the strip sack against Texas Tech. Uh, I think he's going to have a pretty big game getting after Spencer Sanders' ass Saturday um, just because he's, he's where he needs to be. It's that, that return of Jalen Redmond could not have come at a better time for Oklahoma. Yeah, and I know you weren't here, Brandon, for our uh, recap, but and for some of you that might have not watched it, I mentioned entering the year, we all expected Benito to be the big-time playmaker for the defensive line, and he's done a good job over the year. He hasn't – he has, I just don't think he's done anything as impactful as I, Isaiah Thomas has throughout the year when he is able to play his true position because when I tease out at the edge – that dude is in the backfield in the almost backfield. every yeah, single no, he's, play. He's disruptive as hell. Yeah, he's. There was one play he had against uh, Iowa State in their first drive of the game. Um, they had second down and ten, and he literally lost his tackle in literally half a second and blew up Purdy for a third and eighteen. And then they ended up getting that completion down to the one. And I, first of all, this is unrelated because, but. How in the hell can you fault a defensive player like DJ Graham? He got beat on the play. There's no doubt. He gave him a third and 18 completion. But then he made a hell of a play, ripped the ball out. And it's a fumble in my eyes, a fumble through the end zone. Touchback, OU ball. But I guess he's out of bounds or something. Like, I, th- that to me is just a stupid rule. Like, it should have been. The, ball's caught, the ball's caught right there on the sideline. He ripped it out. It went to the end zone. Uh, that's, like I said, unrelated. But I think DJ Graham made a hell of a play there and should have been rewarded for it. But the rules were stupid. Yeah. Also, something that would be interesting to see is if Perion is in any way disciplined at the beginning of the game because of that just dumb, dumb decision to throw the ball at Brees Hall after we had a stop on third down. No, it was second down, but it would have been was like it? third and thrown four. Yeah, I mean, that's still something <laughs> that, that can't happen, especially in a game. Obviously, it didn't affect – the result at the end of the game and against Iowa State because we won. It didn't but... even affect that drive. They ended up punting that drive, but I know exactly what you're talking about. And I guarantee you, um, you know, Tibbs and Lincoln Riley and Alex Grinch have talked to him and been like, hey, next week you can't do that shit. And and I understand, like, he's he's wearing his, you know, like, it's an emotional game. You make a big play, uh, yeah. you, you kind of like it, you know, screw you in a way. That, that That's essentially what he's doing by throwing the ball back at Brees Hall. Like, you know what I mean? He's saying, mm-hmm. like, Hey, here's this little boy. Like, you know what I mean? He's being a yeah. dick. But I mean, that's it's sports. I mean, that's that's it happens. And if he wants to uh, repeat anything he did in last week's game, go ahead and just knock out Spencer Sanders. Put that shoulder to his head and make everyone stress out thinking that thing was head to head. That hit was so nice. And he also could have been taunted for that one too. I don't know if you saw it, but he started doing this. Yeah. So, that, Brock that's, Purdy, which... so Matt Campbell, that's what Matt Campbell was arguing. I know on the comment, <laughs> commentators are saying that Matt Campbell was um, was complaining to the refs about it potentially being a helmet to helmet. But if you watched it while they were discussing, Matt Campbell kept doing this at the refs and saying that that should have been a flag. Like, I guess so, but who cares? I think those taunting penalties are dumb in the first place, unless you're I mean, directly, I, I, I like at the bench and being disrespectful. You made a big play, celebrate it, and move on. Like you, I don't you even think throwing the ball up at, at Brees Hall should have been a taunting. Like if he would have picked the ball up and like while like you know looked at him, taken the full three set drop back and threw it as hard as he could at him, then yeah, that's a penalty play. <laughs> I mean, I think all he did was to like lightly toss it back. Like, how many times have we played football in college in the backyard? And you know, just I think the uh, difference is the the things were getting pretty chippy. The the thing things were getting pretty chippy at that point. And I think at that point, the refs had already pulled the captains aside. And no, it happened them. the next drive. Was it on the next drive? I mean, the things were getting chippy, and I think the refs wanted to to make an example out of someone. And it probably would have been a flag either way, but that just kind of egged on the situation and. They needed to take control of the game. It didn't, it's not like they were too – they didn't affect the game that much at the end of the day. We've seen games where the refs seem to want to make it a story about the refs mm. that controlled this game, but they didn't do too much to affect the result, I don't think. I don't know what you think, but it seemed to be – I hate officials. You know how I feel about yeah. officials. I it was hard to much control over games. Anyway. It was a, it was a normal, normally official uh, officiated game. This Oklahoma State game hopefully is the same. We just need to put it together, and we're going to need to do it two times in a row if we no, want to. If, if our defense does exactly what they've done the past two weeks, 
the Baylor game included, even though we lost that game. Baylor and Iowa State, if we keep them to around that 20, 21 points game mark, I, I believe our offense can score 24. 24, like I, I mentioned, that to me is the magic number. I think Oklahoma State is so bad offensively because I think Spencer Sanders is literally hot dog shit, and I, I, won't, I won't hold it back. I think he's awful. I think he's so bad. If we hold them to 21 and we can score 20, 24, man, and I feel I'm very confident in an Oklahoma offense being able to find 24 points. Although we didn't against Iowa State, because technically Jalen Redmond and 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 Key, and Key Lawrence found a touchdown for us. That's true, but they also got a free seven, so it's like it's like we held them to 14. If we wanted to get nitpicky like that, but obviously, the and other- if you th- also want to think about it, our, against Iowa State, our defense held them to a punt with like eight minutes left. Should have got the ball back. And Matt Campbell drew up a hell of a fake punt. By the way, that, that was a tremendous play call. He must have saw something in the previous four or five punts in which all in which everybody for OU just runs back to punt return and just bank on them doing it again. And he looked like a genius because that punter had 50 yards of nothing. Yeah, special team needs to needs to get this shit together because that can't happen. And obviously that's not gonna happen every week. No, it won't happen again. If you're I'm showing glad. that kind of consistency, I'm, uh, exactly. I'm I'm glad Matt Campbell exposed it. Because now that won't happen again. And first of all, that doesn't make sense to me in the first place anyway. Unless it's fourth and like 35, why are you dropping literally every single person on your defense back to punt return like block as if you're going to house it from your own? It may, it, I mean, it made no sense, but I'm glad Matt Campbell exposed it because now it won't happen again. Yeah, no, that's 100% true. Um, so let's, let's get into our next topic. And you kind of alluded to it earlier in the video. Um, so we kind of discussed it in the preview or in the recap, but Brandon, you weren't there. I know you mentioned Oklahoma is still kind of alive for their playoff hopes with Oregon losing big I to think Utah. Very much so after Utah be coming up really big for us, and Ohio State beat Michigan State. And now this week, yeah. the Ohio State Michigan rivalry is is going to be pretty much the game to watch, other than the Bedlam game for Oklahoma's hopes to to make so, it to the playoffs. Yeah. And that Ohio State Michigan game, we'll talk about that for a second. I don't think it truly matters what happens in that game because at the end of the day, somebody ahead of us is going to lose. Um, with that being said, I prefer Michigan to win still. And that's only because I think Michigan has a greater chance of losing in the Big Ten title game than Ohio State does. But again, at the same, I, I don't think it truly matters because Michigan, if say Michigan loses, they're out then. That's another team we have to worry about. Oregon we have to worry about. I think we all, we're all we both confident in saying Georgia should probably boat race Alabama. And I'll take care of that. I literally think it comes down to – because on Tuesday's playoff uh, ranking whatever show, I guarantee Oklahoma State is going to be damn near that top five. They'll be six or seven or something. Um, so if we could beat them twice in a row – and then it goes back to kind of what I think you were about to allude to earlier when I started bringing this up. I don't think it happens, but, you know, say we beat an Oklahoma State team that is ranked six or seven back-to-back weeks. It's been one of them on the road, one of them a true road game, one of them in the Big 12 championship. Is that enough for Oklahoma to leapfrog a perfect Cincinnati team? I don't think Cincinnati will need to be leapfrogged. I think in the scenario that you're putting together, the only team – Oklahoma needs to leapfrog is Notre Dame. It'll be a battle on which brand is most valuable to the committee at that point. You have to leapfrog Cincinnati because right now they're ahead of us and they're going to be ahead of us. So is Notre Dame. So that's what I'm saying. Cincinnati's probably going to be a top four team this week in their rankings because of Oregon losing. Maybe Michigan might jump them, but it'll it'll correct itself next the weekend after. They'll end up being yeah. a top four no, team. I mean, yeah, that, that's exactly yeah. Like. Yeah, no, like the Big Ten takes care of itself. Um, but I still think we need a Cincinnati loss somewhere. Well, the way – so the way that so far you've explained it, right, if Georgia does beat – assuming Georgia beats Alabama, Alabama should be out. Cincinnati would be in. Ohio State would be in. Or a Big Ten team will be in. So that's three spots taken up by Georgia, a Big Ten, and Cincinnati. And then the fourth would end up being between Oklahoma and Notre Dame, assuming Oklahoma ends up going. We have to, like, based on the committee's own dumbass 
thing that, that they argue. We, we would have to leapfrog Notre Dame strictly on our, the, those last two wins alone, you would think. I agree. I agree because, 100%. And I don't think Notre Dame has a single – I don't – I mean, and this is something we have to fact check, but I, do they have a ranked win on the season? They do not. The only one that would have come was against Cincinnati. And, and they got boat raced. Yeah. So you're saying you think there's a, there's a scenario in which we can make it without even have to worry about – without even having to worry about leapfrogging Cincinnati. Correct. Yeah, I think Cincinnati – they won convincingly get against SMU. The only way that we jump them is if they end up losing to Houston and the championship game. So Oklahoma's only worry should really be: can we put enough of a resume together to leapfrog Notre Dame? And like you mentioned, with the logic that the committee has been using over the last few weeks, we should have enough. We'll, we would have had at that point three ranked wins, and our only loss would be to what was at the time a number a, a top 15 Baylor. So we should be, we should essentially be a top four team if the cards fall how they need to for, for the Sooners, which seem to be. And, 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 your, and your logic then makes a lot of sense. And I, and I, and I would actually agree with it. Um, like if I were the committee member, I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, that being said, I don't trust them at all. I don't trust them more than I can do. I think they're garbage too. Um, so I would still like to see a Cincinnati loss somewhere in there. It would just make you feel a little bit better. Um, there's there's no way we can't leapfrog Notre Dame like that 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 would be a travesty to me yeah I don't think Notre Dame deserves to be in they haven't done anything special they essentially they did the same thing uh Wake Forest was doing and Wake Forest is in the top 10 team right now I mean yeah there's still there's still a lot to play with uh there's still a lot to play for um you know it all starts Saturday yep yeah it'll be big last big last game of the regular season that could potentially roll into a repeat in the big 12. So um, let us know oh, before we wrap it up, our usual end of end of video, do we cover and your score prediction right now? It is well, Oklahoma right State. three and a half, I think. Uh, well, depending on the sports book that you're looking at, Oklahoma State it's either favored by three and a half or four points. Maybe it's four then. So say we're plus four or plus three and a half either way. Uh, yeah. I say we cover because I think we went out right. Um, I think it's very close. I'm gonna circle back to that 24. Uh, let's go. Let's go 24. 24 OU. 24 17 OU. 24. They're not crossing the 20 mark. Oh, well, eh. Spencer Sanders is hot shit. Garbage. <laughs> All right. So we, you think we cover? Especially Rose us this weekend. I'm gonna feel like the biggest idiot of all time on the next podcast. But <laughs> I still think that guy's hot shit. Awful. Hey, you're you're entitled to that. <laughs> he did look like shit last year, so he hasn't proved you wrong yet. Um, I think I think we do. I don't think we cover, but we win. I think. Oh, so if we're plus four. No, and hold half, on. You're right. You're right. I don't think they cover. cover. I don't we think they right, cover. I don't think they cover, and we'll but we'll win by like one or two points. Um, I, it's gonna be a very close game. I really don't want it to be, but it will be. I, I agree with you. It's going to be low scoring. We're either team getting crossing that 20 threshold is going to be big time. I think it, it's probably going to be a race to 20 or 21. Whoever gets there first well, is 20, going to be the winner. That magic number for me. Yeah. Yeah, no, uh, you're, you're probably spot on on that, but it, it'll be a good game. And we just can't let them have – they can't have a win. We have to get to 100 before they even get to 20, you know? That's a fact. Well, unfortunately, we're probably not, we're probably not going to see the series again because they're so butthurt, but or at least cool. for a while. Yeah, you're right. Forgot about that. but So we should get to 100 before they get to 20. Facts. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you all for watching. If you made it this far, we really appreciate it. Make sure that you are going down to the comment section. Let us know what you think. Is Spencer Sanders dog shit in your opinion? Yes. <laughs> Do the Sooners uh, have a chance against Oklahoma State? Um, and will they make it to the playoffs? I know it seems very, very uh, unlikely, but we just mapped out a way that they potentially could make it as a number four seed into the college football playoffs. And anything could happen, you know, in the NFL on any given Sunday and in college sports any given Saturday. And hopefully this these last two weeks go in Oklahoma's favor. 
Uh, make sure you are also liking and subscribing. Turn on that notification bell. We are going to start releasing some videos on basketball as we are starting. We're going to get into conference play soon. I believe they play Florida and Butler in their last two non-conference games. So there'll be big games for Oklahoma to see what Porter Moser can do for the basketball team. Um, thank you all for watching. We really appreciate it. We'll see you next time.